2 Corinthians 7, chapter number 7, verse number 8 says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry that it were but for a season. Paul says, basically, sorry, not sorry, that I wrote this letter. And he says, now I rejoice that, that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. He said, I'm excited that, that this letter made you sorry, but it drew you to repentance. It led you to repentance. You, you, you had a, a godly sorrow. You, you, you had a, a, a sorrow that led you to something spiritual. And, and, and he says at the end that you might not receive damage by us in nothing. In other words, uh, it didn't hurt you that I said this to you. You could have taken it that way. You could have been offended, but you weren't. And verse 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of or not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. That last verse, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Today I want to preach to you from this subject, godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. Amen, amen. Before we are seated, I wonder if you could just pray with me one more time. And I want us to pray that God would just move on our hearts today. God is already doing something here today. I feel his presence here. He's moving. He's doing something. But I believe that, that he has a word for somebody here today. And I want us to open our hearts, open our minds right now to receive what God has for us. Lord, we come before you, God. We're thankful for what we felt thus far in this service, God. But, but God, we know there's more for us today, God. We know there's that you desire for us to go a little deeper today, God. And we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds, God. Help us to receive, God. Help us to apply this to our lives, God, today. In the name of Jesus. And everybody say amen. Man, you can be seated. Amen, amen. How many want the will of the Lord to be done today? How many really want the will of the Lord to be done today? How many have the attitude, not my will, but thy will be done? Come on, somebody. How many has the attitude, not my will, God, but, but yours be done? Now, I don't mean let's not just say it. Let's mean it. Don't just say, oh, God, I, not, not my will, but, but as soon as it's inconvenient, you, you change your mind. It's something that not, we don't just say, but we have to live it. Not my will, but yours be done. You know, I was thinking about this this week and uh, praying and trying to figure out what, what the Lord would have for me to, to preach, you know, and almost... So Brother Corner just bring some slides because God didn't give me anything. And then I was, uh, I was just hit with this, this message, godly sorrow. And I thought about it. And when is the last time that sin made you sad? When is the last time that, that sinful things made you, made you sorrowful? And I'm not talking about your own sin. Okay, I'm talking about others' sin. When is the last time that you looked at the state of the world and, and how sinful the world is and, and you were sad about it? When is the last time you felt that, that sorrow for the things that are going on in the world? And, and I, I'll be honest with you, the, the emotion that I feel first usually is anger. I'm usually upset about the things I see. I'm mad about, you know, seeing this and, you know, they're pushing this on our kids and this agenda's here and this agenda, you can't, I mean, you literally can't watch a show without seeing an agenda push. When's the last time you saw a preacher in, in an episode of any show and, and he's, he's portrayed in a good light? When is the last time you watched anything and, and they put a, a, a preacher or, or, or parents that were living for the Lord and it was in a good light? Why, when, when they weren't the bad guy. Every time I've seen it, 
It's always been that they're the bad person. They're the controlling person. They're this, they're that. You know, this is not the way we need to be. They're always portrayed in a light that's, that's not good. As if there are no good Christian people. They're, that having standards and having morals is, is a bad thing. When, when have you looked at that and felt sad about it? Felt sorrowful? Felt this, this just overwhelming grief? for where, where the world is. And I, I, I was thinking about this, and I was like, man, we, sh- we should feel this more. I thought about Jesus in this, and how many times do you remember Jesus being angry? Go ahead, you can answer. How many times? How many times do you think of in the Bible? Anybody? One? Yep. Twice? How many times do you remember him being moved with compassion? All the time, right? Now, you can't even put a number up because you can't remember how many times it happened because it happened so much. And, and, and I looked at that, and we're supposed to be like him, right? <laughs> so why are we so, so quick to go to anger instead of compassion? Why are we moved with, with this anger and we're, we're mad about this and they shouldn't be like that and this said not happen and I can't believe they said that or they did that. We should be moved on with compassion. We should be moved on with compassion. I mean, look at Jesus on the cross when he could have been angry. He should have been angry. All these people that were his friends, you know, some of his, his close friend betrayed him. These people that would say, Hosanna in the highest now saying, crucify you, crucify him, crucify him. And what does he say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He was moved on with compassion not anger. And where have we come as a church where we are so angry at the world and mad about the things we see when they don't know any better? We see people that don't know any better, and we, we act like that they have a responsibility to know Christ and to, and to have some morality, right? We look at people and we say, man, I can't believe they did that. And we look at People in, uh, I remember seeing when the Grammys happened, and, and I saw these, these uh, YouTubers get on, and I, you can't believe what just happened at the Grammys. And evil and this and this and this. And, and why are we surprised? Why are we shocked that people are looking for something, anything to fill this void that they have in their life? And we're shocked that they turn to the enemy, and they're worshiping the devil, and we're angry about it when we should be moved on with compassion. See, we got to get rid of this Christian arrogance we have. We got to get rid of this arrogance that we have as Christians, that we're better than everybody else. And that uh, I can't believe they did that. And I'm going to go to Facebook and I'm going to write about it. And I'm going to tell them how evil they are. I got quiet when I mentioned Facebook. I'm amazed at the things that Christians right on Facebook. I'm amazed at the things that Christians will respond to and argue about. Let me tell you something. Let me just give you a word of advice. This is for free. This is for free. Let me tell you something. When, when you're on Facebook, Instagram, what, whatever you're on, TikTok, doesn't matter, and you're, and you're arguing about Christian things and you're saying that, you know, this is it, it we're, we're not trying to let people know that we're right, okay? This is, that's not our goal because you may be right and you may prove a point, but that person will never come to God because they're angry or you've offended them or you've put a barrier in place. Don't put a barrier in place. We need to show love. And sometimes that means keeping your mouth shut. It's true. Sometimes that means you got to keep it shut. We got to get rid of this Christian arrogance that we have and we, we have to lead people to repentance, to a godly sorrow, to a changed life. I remember, and I think I've told this before, but I was at a conference, and uh, there was a panel of, of preachers, and one of them was Joel Osteen. I heard of Joel Osteen, mega church there in, in Houston. And he was speaking, and he said, he told this story when he became pastor, and he said, when I, when I was becoming pastor of the church, and my dad his dad um, uh, was retiring or 
uh, was going to give him the church. And, and he was telling, he said, you know, my dad would preach hard things. He would preach about, you know, sin and, you know, getting your life changed and repentance and all of this. And he said, you know, I just, he said, I just didn't want to do it. He said, I just, I didn't want to preach hard stuff. He said, I just wanted to preach the good things of God. I wanted to preach prosperity. I wanted to preach the blessings of God. And he said, I didn't want to preach any of that stuff. And it really shocked me that a pastor would say, I don't want to preach about sin. I don't want to lead people to repentance, to a changed life. I just want to preach about the good things of God. And it's easy to preach about the good things of God. You know, it's, that's, that's great. We all love to preach about the good things of God. And I love the good things of God. I love the blessings of God. But there's another side of it. You got to preach about sin. You got to preach about repentance. You got to, people have to have a life change. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Why are we here? And as I thought about it, I was, I was just kind of moved on with sorrow. Like, God. We need to pray for these people. We need to pray for them that, that they'll see God, that they'll see God in us, that we can take off this arrogance and this anger and, and have compassion for others, and we can be moved on with compassion. See, we want people to repent. We want people to repent every day. You need to repent every single day. I, I think about repentance like, doing the dishes. How many, how many like doing dishes? There's always a few weirdos. There's always a few weirdos that like doing dishes. I mean, you know what I mean? You, you got to go. How many like folding laundry? Weirdos, again. I, I tell you, that, that, nobody likes folding laundry. There are people that like to fold laundry, and if you do, my address is... <laughs> Neither me or my wife like to fold laundry. Now, we can wash and dry some clothes. <laughs> boy, I can wash and dry them. Boy, you, you better know it. But there would be five baskets of clothes that need to be folded. <laughs> I can't wait for these kids to learn. Sometimes I let them try. You know, just fold it up, man. Throw it in there. You'll be all right. <laughs> I hate washing dishes. I hate folding clothes. I hate it, you know. I just can't stand it. But how many of you like? Clean dishes. Okay, there we go. How many like a clean kitchen? How many like to go and, and, and open up your drawer and everything is folded neatly and you can just pull out what you need? <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah, we all like that. <laughs> we all like that. We all like to go and have clean dishes. But, you know, most of us, other than those few that are on the narrow way, they like to wash dishes. We don't like to wash dishes. But I, I'm going to tell you the best time to wash dishes is right after you cook. As soon as you eat, while the pans are still hot. Because it's easy to clean. You ever clean dishes right after? Right after you cook, and that, that, that sauce is still hot. That pasta sauce is still hot. But when you leave that pasta sauce, man, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to spend a week cleaning that off. You're going to let it sit in that soap for three or four days, dump it, put some more soap and water in it, let it sit for a couple more days. And then scrape it off. You know what I mean? It's overwhelming. When you see those dishes, you're just like, man, I can't even get started. It's going to take me forever. When you see those five baskets of clothes, you said, man, just pick out what you need. And by the time you get to folding, you already started a whole nother load of work. <laughs> because we don't like to do that. And repentance is like that. Sin is like that. If you leave sin in your life, Days and days and days. And sometimes, you know, your personality affects your spiritual personality. You know, if you're a procrastinator, sometimes you want to procrastinate with sin in your life. And you want to come and say, I'll just take care of it on Sunday. Well, you got, you got six more days before Sunday. Well, I'll just take care of it when I get to church. And, and when you get to church, you're just wrestling with it. You're struggling with it. You're sitting there. You can't lift your hands. You, you know you got to take, God, I just, oh, I got this in my life, and I just let it sit, and it's caked on now, and I got to scrape it off. I got to sit here and just, oh, let, I got to bask in your presence for a few minutes so I can get this junk out of my life. Sin is like that. If you, if you don't get rid of it quickly, 
It can just sit there and cake on, and it's more and more, and then it becomes this overwhelming thing you got to do. I got to get this altar because I got to, oh, man, and you're just struggling. You're in the altar, and you're just crying and crying, and you just, you can't lift your hands yet. I can't worship yet because I got all this sin in my life. When you, what you need to do is when you, when you have sin in your life, take care of it. Take care of it immediately. When something happens and you say something, you do something, you say, God, right now, I repent of my sins right now. God, I don't want this in my life. I don't need to carry this day after day after day after day. Just get rid of it. Just repent. Get rid of it. God wants us to repent. In fact, he made a way for us to repent. We live in a, in a time of grace. It wasn't always like this. Before this, it was what we call the dispensation of the law, and we were under the law. And, uh, and this started, you know, in the garden. Adam and Eve, they were living in paradise. Everything was great. Everything was awesome, except for this one tree, you know, they, they couldn't eat of. And we know the story. They ate of the tree, and sin entered the world, and everything changed. Now humanity had this sin problem, and it didn't take long. Once sin is in the world, once sin, you know, in humanity, once we have this flesh, it didn't take long for this to manifest, right? As soon as they had their kids here, Cain killed his brother Abel. Now you imagine that? I mean, man, you're like, wow, that happened fast. That's how sin works. Humanity was broken. So God is, is going to establish a law, and a law to live by, and we see this in uh, with Moses and what we call the Ten Commandments. You know, don't have any other gods before me. Don't serve any idols. Don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. Keep the Sabbath day. Make it holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't covet. God spoke his law. This is just the first ten. It ended up being about 613 commandments. And they had... Uh, they had a way, a way to atone for their sin. They had offerings they did. They had uh, one just called a burnt offering, an atonement for sin. They had a grain offering to show devotion to God, a peace offering, commitment to peace, a purification offering, another atonement for sins of the people, and, and a reparations offering for unintentional sin. They had ways to atone for their sins, and they had to follow these rules, and there was all of these regulations. If you want to read that, be my guest. Exodus chapter 20 and 10 more chapters. Go for it. It's good, good reading after church. And you can read about all the rules and regulations and everything that they had to do and all of this stuff. But human nature takes over. Right? Even after the children of Israel heard about the law and they heard all this stuff, don't have another God, what do they do? Exodus 32 and, and 1 right after everything was just mentioned, right? Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that, that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Now, this is such an interesting thing. This was, to me, a great picture of COVID. COVID hit. And they were like, well, I don't know when we're going to go back to church. So we don't might as well do our own thing. And, and real Christians started coming out in COVID, right? You realize who was really going to be living for God and who wasn't. Who was just looking for any excuse. Well, I don't know when pastor's going to preach again. So I'm just going to do my own thing here. Serve my own God. And these are people that heard the voice of the Lord say, don't serve any other gods. But because pastor wasn't around, they said, well, listen, listen, let's, uh, let's just do something different here. And, and Aaron, Moses' brother, stood beside him, was like, okay, <laughs> really? <laughs> and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten calf. Then they said, this is our God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, you know, you know, God was ticked. 
He said, wait a minute. <laughs> first of all, you, first you're going to make a golden image. You're going to make another God. But then you're going to say that this is now the God that brought you out of Egypt? Mm. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Mm. Then they arose early on the next day. Uh, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And you know they ain't playing right. And you know, this, when this happens, you can imagine the anger of the Lord. I, I mean, God was so angry, he's like, Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. I'll just kill them all. Let's start over. And Moses is like, no, God, just don't do that. Let's not do that. Let's, let, let's, let's just give him another shot here. And Moses comes down from the mountain, and he's angry, as you could imagine, seeing these people who, who you just talked to, just said, hey, we're, we got all these rules, got the law, don't do this, don't have other gods, and I'm coming down, I've been gone for a few days, and here we are. And, it, and, and he broke the tablets before. And this was just a cycle over and over, they did this. Over and over, they, they, they got right. They were, you know, all, they were God's people, good to go. Humanity's sin, all this stuff. And now it's, it's this pattern of sin. They're in bondage. They're getting judged. And now they're back to repentance, freed from bondage. Over and over, the cycle goes. And, uh, and, and some of us get stuck in this cycle as well. Until Jesus comes on the scene. Now, when Jesus comes, he says something interesting. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law. And he says this, and, and, and then he begins to explain it. He says, now, the law says don't murder, but I'm going to tell you, if you hate your brother, you'll be judged. The law says don't commit adultery, but... I'm going to tell you, if you look at someone else and lust after them, you've already committed adultery. The law says don't swear falsely, but I'm going to tell you, don't swear at all. The law says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I'm going to tell you to turn the other cheek. The law says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I'm going to tell you to love them both. Pray for them. Have compassion for them. In the law, we, we prayed in public, but I'm going to tell you to pray in secret. We had fasting that we did, and, and it was that we had this day and this day, right? But I'm going to tell you to fast in secret. Don't let people know you're fasting. Don't let people look at you and, and, and say, oh, you, you know, I'm, just, I'm so weak. Just been fasting for the last 48 hours. No, I'm going to tell you don't do that. Jesus says that you need to lay up treasures in heaven. There's nothing on this earth that you can want. There's nothing on this earth that, that, needs, that you need for, for the long haul. I'm going to tell you, this is just temporary. You need to lay up treasures in heaven. See, Jesus fulfilled the law, and, and really it comes down to two things, loving God and loving people. And that's, and that's what we say around here, life, right? We love God and we love people because that really fulfills the law. If we can love God, and we can love people, we're going to be all right. See, when Jesus died on the cross, see, it, it ended this dispensation of the law, and now we, we enter into a new, a new area of grace, and that's what we could get to enjoy today. No longer are we bound by the law, but by grace. Romans six eleven says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, but you, uh, for you are not under the law, but under grace. How many are thankful for the grace of God? We're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. Amen. We now have the opportunity to receive forgiveness from our sins because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. We don't need another sacrifice. When he shed his blood for us, that is all we needed. That is all we needed. 
So when we repent, and uh, sometimes, you know, we, we, we talk about repentance quickly, and, but I want to break it down a little bit for you today. In our text, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, but uh, worldly uh, sorrow worketh death. So what is this godly sorrow and what is worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow is all about me. It's all about selfishness. It's all about how I feel, how my sin affects me. I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm grieving over my reputation. I'm grieving over the collateral damage of my family because of my sin. I'm, uh, it's all about me. I, you know, I'm just me, me, me. I'm thinking about how people are going to look at me and how people are going to make me feel. I'm focused only on myself and my sin. I'm not even, I'm looking at the now. I'm only looking at what's happening in my life right now, not the future. And that leads us to self-pity, self-protection. You know, no one can find out. I don't want anybody to know. I'm going to just work on it myself. Self-justification. We say, oh, I'm only human. Everybody sins, right? That's what the world says. I'm only human. It's, we're all sinners, right? Yes, it's true. We're all born into sin, but that doesn't mean we stay there. We don't stay there. Self-effort. I can fix this problem alone. I don't need anybody. And then ultimately it leads us to self-condemnation where we just feel hopeless and helpless. See, worldly sorrow, uh, it only lasts until that, that, you know, that whatever you're going through, it passes. And oftentimes no repentance really takes place. You're just sorry for what happened. And then often you'll return to that same sin. You return to that same, the the Bible says the dogs return to the vomit. But godly sorrow is different. Godly sorrow is not selfish at all. Godly sorrow, it it looks at your relationship with God, how my sin affects my relationship with God. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing or what everybody else thinks about me, but I'm looking at how does this affect my relationship with him, how my sin has grieved the heart of God. How can I make it right with God? How can I clean my heart? I, I want to focus not on the here and now, but on my future. I, I want to I I be saved. I want to make it to heaven. I'm not worried about what people are thinking about me right now. Some people don't go to the altar because they're worried about what everybody else is thinking about them. You don't have time to worry about what everybody else is thinking about you. You need to make it right. Get in the altar and take care of it. Don't worry about what people think or what they're looking at. And most of the time, people ain't worried about you. If I can say it like that, we, we, they ain't worried about you. You up here thinking about everybody looking at you? Anybody looking at you? I ain't worried about you. They'll they be like, I got some sin I need to work on. <laughs> you know? I got stuff in my own life. You know, We can't worry about what everybody is thinking. The, 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 you know, your mind just will go and go, and you're just, you won't take care of it. You got to take care of it. The enemy wants you to, to get in that cycle where you're not, you're not taking care of it. You're not repenting. You're not having that godly sorrow. See, godly sorrow will lead you to repentance without regret. It will lead you to confession, correction, restoration, sanctification. It will lead you to a place where you hate the sin, not just the consequences of sin. Too many times we just hate the consequences of sin. Joel 2.13 says, So rend your heart and not your garment. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. He's saying, rend your heart. Don't worry about the outside. We, we, we focus so much, and we want to look right. We want to look good. Let everybody know we're doing okay. Everything is fine in our lives, and we know that the devil is having his way with it. We look good on the outside, but on the inside, we're struggling. On the outside, everything looks fine, and they seem okay. You know, or praise God. You know, they came in waved at everybody, it's all good. But on the inside, they're dealing with things. They're struggling with things. God says, rend your heart, not your garments. Don't worry about what's on the outside. Worry about taking care of what's on the inside. See, repentance is is not just a quick 30-second prayer. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. I told you, Micah told me, you know, he was doing something. I said, stop. He said, sorry, sorry, sorry. And he just did it again. And then he said, sorry, sorry, sorry. He just did it again. Sorry, sorry. I said, one more time. Sorry, one more time. (laughs) But to him, he was just, oh, I'm just saying sorry so I can get out of trouble. That's not what repentance is. 
It's not just feeling bad. It's not, you know, just knowing like, man, I want to change, but I'm not really going to. Repentance is confessing with the intention to change. It's not just, you know, saying I'm I'm confessing this, God. I want to repent. I'm sorry about it. But I have an intention to do something different. Repentance focuses on your relationship with God. It focuses on your future with God. And and it's not just talking. You got to do something. See, people think that, oh, they'll repent and say, okay, God, I'm so sorry for what I did. But you you already have a, a date to do it again. You know what I mean? Some people think, oh, I'm going to repent of this, but I still got this thing at home that I haven't removed from my house. God, I'm sorry for, for looking at pornography, but I still have an account with, with, with the, the, the porn site. God, I'm sorry for what I watched this week, but, you know, I still, I still got my HBO Max, you know. I'm not, I'm not preaching HBO Max now. I'm just saying. It's probably not much good on there. If anything, but you know, I'm I'm still gonna I'm still gonna watch that, do this, go there, but I'm sorry for it, God. I'm sorry for it. That's not repentance. Repentance means you you are intentional about changing some things in your life. That means you gotta go home and say, All right, I gotta get this out of my life. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go here anymore, God. I'm gonna lose this number. I'm not gonna keep this number in my in, in my phone. Repentance means making an intentional change. Sometimes that means you got to get rid of some people in your life, too. Sometimes we repent and say, God, I'm not going to do this anymore, but I still got friends that put me in that same position. Sometimes you got to get rid of some people in your life. You got to cut some people out of your life and say, listen, I'm not going to do that anymore. You're welcome to come with me to church. You're welcome to come with me to Bible study. You're welcome to come and eat at my house, but we're not going to do that here. We're not going to drink. We're not going to smoke. We're not going to do that. We're not going to cuss in my house. Th- these are the things you have to do. Sometimes you've got to separate yourself from people in repentance. See, this is something we don't talk about repentance. We talk about coming in the altar, but there's some things you've got to do outside of the altar when you're truly repenting. You've got to cut some things out of your life if you want God to forgive you because there is no true repentance without change. Repentance has to have change. Amen? And we see this uh, in the life of David. How many remember the story of David and Bathsheba? David sinned, and, and he did, I mean, he did, a, it was a doozy, you know. David just didn't sleep with another man's wife, but he killed the guy, covered it up, you know, still slept with the man's wife. And then took her and said, we're going to get married now that your husband's dead. And I I wonder what she thought of this, you know. You ever think about how she thought? You know, like, all right, man, like, I mean, I just feel like I would be like, hey, maybe we need to pump the brakes on this, you know. This is kind of crazy, you know. We're in in a web of lies now. And, and, uh, you know, he goes through and does all this stuff, and, and then he gets confronted with his sin. And the prophet tells him about his sin, and, and then he's moved to repentance. And I, I want us to look at this repentance together. And there, there, was, there, was two, there was two chapters that we look at. I want to look at Psalm 51. But the other one is when he's praying and he's praying for this, the, the child that's going to die because of his sin. And, and because of his sin, God says, I'm going to judge you and this child is not going to live. But he still prays for this child. He, and he, he says, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God because I don't know if God is going to be merciful. Now, how many have prayed this prayer? How many have said, God, if you'll get me out of this, I'll, I'll live for you after this. I'll live, God, if you'll, just, if you'll just get this out of me, you know, just, just let me get past this and let, don't let anybody find out, you know. How many prayed that prayer? Come on, every hand should be lifted in this place because we all prayed it. This is, this is a, a, a selfish prayer. And, and we've all prayed it, and, and who knows? God may be merciful at times. So I'm not saying don't pray it, but I'm just, I want to show you the difference, the contrast between these two prayers. So he prays for this child, and this child ends up dying. And as soon as the child's dead, he gets up, cleans his face up, puts some new clothes on, eats a meal. And his servant's are like, well, what's going on? He's like, well, I mean, the child died. That's what I was praying for. I'm done now. But his other prayer is a true prayer of repentance. 
with godly sorrow. Psalm 51, verse 1 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may uh, be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will take, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you have, uh, you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. And I love this verse. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted to you. See, when you, when you have godly sorrow, it's not just about you. It's about others. You say, God, forgive me, but also I'm going to teach others not to follow in this way. I'm going to teach others not to go down this road. I'm going to teach others that how I messed up so that they don't have to mess up. I'm going to teach our young people, don't go down this path. We've been there. We've done that. Don't go down that road. I will teach others. I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. That's not by anger. That's by compassion. It's by loving others. Coming to people with sorrowful spirit, a humble spirit, not arrogant. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. And it doesn't mean he didn't sacrifice or give burnt offering, but that's not what God was interested in at this time. He wanted obedience, repentance. He wanted him to be humble. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. See, before I give this offering, I've got to take care of some things inside. Sometimes we think because we're doing good things, doing good deeds, that it's okay. It's all right. We're, we're doing good things. I don't have to take care of this, but there's some things that you got to take care of. I want us to stand together. When you're truly repenting with godly sorrow, sometimes there are, there's some action that needs to take place. Sometimes you just can't come down to the altar and just say, God, forgive me, and just walk out. Sometimes there's some phone calls that need to be made to people and say, you know what? I did you dirty. I did you wrong. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And this is difficult for us to do as human beings. We have pride. We don't want people to see us in a bad light. But you will be amazed at how people will see you if you come humbly and say, you know what, I messed up. And I'm not too big to let you know that I messed up. And I need to make it right. For some of you, you need to go home and, and take some things out of your house. Get rid of some things that's in your life. Some people need to get rid of some friends. Maybe some loved ones, you know. Maybe you got to separate yourself from some family. 
Maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's relationships that are not good for you. And that's hard. It's hard when the heart is involved, but sometimes you got to separate yourself and say, God, this relationship is not of you. You got to be honest. You got to be open for the Lord, just like David was, creating me a clean heart, oh God, renewing me a right spirit, oh God. God, I confess to you right now, God, I need you. I need you. I really believe there's somebody here that needs to take care of some things in their lives, in their heart, some things they got to get rid of. But it starts in this altar. And I want us to come down to the altar together, and we can all come and repent because we all need repentance every day. So I open these altars. Please make your way to the altar right now. And let's take care of some things that are in our hearts right now. And as you're praying, I want you to think about the things you need to take care of. I want you to make a mental list in your mind. Say, all right, God, I'm sorry for this, God. God, I repent for the things that I've done. You know what I've done, God. I confess to you, God, right now. But I'm going to make a list in my mind, God. Okay, I'm not going to go here anymore. I'm not going to talk to this person anymore. God, I'm going to put some parameters in my life, God. I'm not going to I'm not going to go to social media and and, and, and there's there's DMs that I got God I'm going to get rid of that right now I'm going to cut that off God I'm going to make some parameters in my life I'm not going to go to the explore page and, and, see, and see the temptation that's there God I'm going to get rid of that God I'm going to change the way I'm walking God I'm going to change the way I'm talking I'm going to change the way I'm living God I'm going to change the what the things that I'm doing God right now Lord I'm making a list right now of things that I got to check off my list God I'm going to make it right with this person that I know I offended. That I know that I, I've done something that, that is causing offense, God. I'm going to call them and I'm going to make it right. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.